I'm honored to be among this amazing community. I'm Sana Jaffrey. I'm program officer with the Chicago Learning Exchange, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about me, uh, our work. Uh, this is me, that little person um, in there, and that's my cute baby. You can say aw. Thank you. Um, so it's been a little while since I've been at Shy Hack Night. It's been about two and a half years because uh, I had this little one, and now he's not so little, but it's awesome um, and tiring. And, uh, but before I get into kind of more about me, I actually want to learn about you all as learners. So if you have a device, whether it's a smartphone or a computer, um, you could take it out at this time, and I'd love to learn a little bit more about you all as learners. Uh, and in also the Shy Hack Night spirit, we want to make things active and participatory, so uh, I hope that you will participate. And for uh, the, the, it's up here, but I'll say it as well, it's HTTP colon forward slash forward slash bit bit dot ly forward slash shy hack night learning. It's five questions, very short, easy. Um, I'm just going to share this real quick with you um, so you can see kind of the feedback. So you all own a computer, which is awesome and predictable, but the folks that we serve don't always own computers and um, don't have internet access at home. Uh, also, what the pedagogy that kind of drives our work is called connected learning, which I'll talk about in more detail later. Uh, but basically, we see kind of a diversity of learning, right? Some people like to learn through lecture. Um, a lot of people like to learn, on, learn through hands-on ways, um, discussion, et cetera. So research actually backs this up, and we know a lot about learning. And, and young people and adults learn better when their learning is hands-on, participatory. However, Traditional models of education focus on kind of consumption and rote memorization and things like that. We, Chicago Learning Exchange, hope to change that. Um, we also realize that, you know, oftentimes we are in traditional modes of education, the teacher is the only audience, but research also shows that young people can learn better when they're learning with their peers or getting feedback from their parents and other people that are trusted. So these are kind of the things that are undergirding principles that drive connected learning and kind of the pedagogy that, that institutes our work. So thank you all for participating. Um, and I'll get back into kind of uh, a little bit more about me. Um, so I will say that I am, when I started this work three and a half years ago, I was a noob. Um, I definitely had a lot of experience in education. I was a high school teacher, both in English and journalism, and uh, I had other experiences in nonprofits and um, teaching in India and working with uh, nonprofits on the South Side called Inner City Muslim Action Network, Iman for short. Um, all of those experiences tied together with an emphasis on social change. Um, but when I walked into this job, I was a noob, definitely. Um, but that's similar to many of the educators that we serve as well as part of the Hive Chicago Learning Network. So Hive is similar to Shy Hack Night in that it's a peer learning community for innovation and education. So um, it's a simple, similar open community, except we have our meetings monthly instead of weekly. So shout out to you all for meeting weekly. Um, but we're a community of educators, technologists, parents, researchers who care about making sure, making sure that learning is not the traditional way, that we can use digital technology to uh, provide more meaningful learning opportunities and make sure that Chicago youth who usually may not have access to these learning opportunities have access and experience these opportunities as well. So how do we do this? We have members that range in size from a one-person nonprofit that uh, Jackie Moore, who runs Agape Works on the South Side, she has a robotics program, um, to medium-sized nonprofits like Free Spirit Media that does journalism and uh, youth voice programming, um, to the big cultural institutions. So the museums, the uh, Peggy Note about Nature Museum, the Art Institute, et cetera. So these are all kind of our groups, um, members, uh, EE with Mumkin Studios. Um, and then we have the big city agencies like the park districts and the libraries as well. So we have a huge breadth of our membership. Um, we have monthly meetups and convenings and um, workshops and events. And this is kind of not necessarily an advertisement for our work, but this my story connects to the Hive. And so I want to kind of explain what the Hive is before I get into kind of more about me. So um, moonshots are similar to the Shy Hack Night community working groups that you all have, except we have this cool name called moonshots. 
Um, and together we seek to come together to think about what are the shared problems that, you know, whether you're a small nonprofit on the south side um, or whether you're the big institution in downtown, these are shared problems. So for example, transportation. There's a lot of amazing learning opportunities in Chicago, but transportation is a barrier or um, safety is a concern for getting from one place to the next. So how do we come together to address those challenges? Our communities have actually intersected. So if some of you have been part of Shy Hack Night for a while, you may have seen. Um, we supported a project called the Civic Tech Internship, which Eve is here, can tell you a little bit more about, um, with Mikva Challenge, basically to bring young people into this space as well, so they can experience civic tech and be um, inspired to, to better their community and, and government. Um, they also worked on a project called EduMap, which I think is still living. I saw on the Shy Hack Night working groups, um, which is a computer science curriculum. But basically, it was designed to bring young people to the space so that they could be inspired to also uh, be empowered to, to be change agents. Another kind of intersection of our world is Ride With Me. Uh, how many, do any of you remember Robert Friedman? crazy kooky guy with glasses, yeah. So he's in Austin now, but um, he was working with a few people here in, in Chai Hack Night community to address this problem of transportation. So Ride With Me was an app that was developed um, to have basically be a peer-to-peer, -a, -peer, a youth to youth um, transportation tool. And we rolled it up into one of our, our other sister organizations called the Chicago City of Learning, which is kind of almost like a Yelp for learning. So if you wanted to know where coding opportunities are in Chicago, you could learn, you could search by topic or you could um, search by your zip code, et cetera. And so you could see where all the learning opportunities are. They've integrated Ride With Me um, into their platform. So there's, again, a lot of intersection. Um, also, our educators are connected to these principles, which I didn't know anything about when I started this work, working in the open, open leadership. Um, these are things that we are, one of our supporters and kind of stewards of our previous work was Mozilla Foundation, and so they've um, helped us to understand why working in the open might be valuable and is a, is a thing that can be potentially implemented with teens. Uh, it might be a little challenging at times, but because um, of privacy and data and other things like that, but, um, but, but it's possible as well. So going back into kind of my story and kind of the story of the educators that we serve, we are, a lot of the folks that we come into are noobs maybe when they walk in through our doors and in the meetups, but by the end, they're solutionaries. And my story is similar to those educators. So I feel like uh, Sonia <laughs> inspired me to say that I'm education technologist. Maybe a little feel like a little, um, uncomfortable with that, that, but I'm going to own it right now. Um, and I feel like I'm an prop, empowered problem solver, so I can think about what are the education challenges in Chicago and how can we come together to address them. So noob to solutionary is something that our members go through and also is integral to kind of my own story. So I'm going to pause there. Um, and we do it because we want young people to also feel like they're solutionaries. But you can't talk about young people if you're not going to talk about the educators and trusted adults and that still guide them, regardless of what technology is in the room. Cool. So I'm going to stop for just a second, and I'm going to get a pulse. If you guys want to, we have this new organization called the Chicago Learning Exchange. I can tell you a little bit more about that, or we can pause for questions and see what else is out there. Chicago Learning Exchange, high f hands in the air. Cool, awesome, Mar making Maria happy. <laughs> um, so this is our past structure. Um, Mozilla uh, Foundation was the steward of the Hive Chicago Learning Network, and we use steward as a term for basically employer. Um, and the Chicago Community Trust was uh, our steward, and I was kind of more in this world, but we're kind of across, across of all those uh, areas. And in 2018, we're excited. We are forming a new organization called the Chicago Learning Exchange, if you Google it. There is no website, but it will be coming. Um, or maybe we have the URL saved, I don't know. But um, 
our work, LRNG, so my colleague Jessica works on LRNG Chicago, which is a digital learning and workforce uh, badging platform. It's actually a national platform that was created to think about how, to, how do young people don't just learn in school, they don't learn out, out of school, they don't just learn out of school. How can you make some of those learning experiences um, in, online and in person? Um, and then how do you connect those learning experiences to workforce opportunities, so jobs, et cetera, things like that. And then one thing that's different in the out of school time space that is, uh, I don't know if you, how many of you all went to after school programs and things like that? Awesome, so a good amount. Um, so it's an amazing community, amazing place, but a lot of times it's not recognized as learning. So how do we recognize the real richness that happens in the out of school time space? Badging or micro-credentials is a way for us to think about that. So there is learning happening when a young person goes to the Adler um, Planetarium. There is, young, there is learning that happens when they go to Yolo Kali Arts Reach and create a podcast, et cetera. Um, so digital badging is a way for us to capture that learning and then also a person can um, take it with them and then also a young person can get the kind of develop the language to understand what assets that they do have. So for example for me I didn't know like oh I'm laid back and flexible that's not that doesn't sound very flex, uh, professional um, and someone else said you're agile and I was like oh yeah that's the word I'm gonna use. Um, and that's, that's true for young people, it's true for adults, and, and that's kind of what we're doing with LRNG Chicago. My work relates more to the grant making, so making it rain for folks. Um, I'm lucky to do that and provide funding to groups to think about these ideas. We have a kind of a design thinking process that um, takes projects through the design thinking process, so they're able to prototype their idea, then pilot it, then you know, hopefully scale it, et cetera. And I told you a little bit about the Hive Network, which is a peer-to-peer -peer professional learning community. Um, we have our meetings usually the third Thursday of the month. Uh, they're usually at the Harold Washington Library, which is kind of a central location, but we've been also experimenting, similar to Shy Hack Night, with different locations as well. We were just last month at the Gary Comer Youth Center. So you're welcome to come if you're free and available. Um, third Thursday of the month, nine to noon it's during working hours we realize um, but you know it's an open community similar to shy hack night and we'd love for if you care about young people and want to uh, you know be a mentor etc things like that we, we'd happy we would also be happy to um, plug you into one of our member organizations if you're interested in, in that so um, our mission is to inspire and support innovation that equips digital age learners and leaders to close Chicago's opportunity gap. So we know that some young people are accessing these opportunities already, but there is a gap. There is a huge gap um, in Chicago. There's a city of the haves and have not. So we are, our mission is to make sure that we close that gap and make sure that educators, um, so leaders uh, and learners are also equipped to do that. And some of our assets include, um, so LRNG, these are some of our accomplishments. So LRNG Chicago is, uh, was piloted last year with the One Summer Chicago, which is the big jobs program in Chicago. It uh, serves 30,000 youth in Chicago. Um, for a lot of times, this is the, for a young person, their first time they're working in a working setting. Um, so how do you interview? How do you, um, what do you do with your check? You know kind of basic financial literacy skills. Um, also, what skills are you developing? Are you doing teamwork, collaboration, these kind of 21st century skills as we call it. Um, grant making, we've served about 20,000 youth through our funded projects and granted over $7 million. Um, excited uh, about what's next for our organization and how we can continue to have impact. And uh, I think this is true. Um, we also launched the first landscape scan to understand kind of the city, city perspective. So where are the digital media tools and technologies um, opportunities? Where do they lie? Do they lie mainly on the north side? Do they lie on the west side, south side, et cetera? Um, and how can we address the opportunities and needs? Um, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential. Um, and then Hive Chicago, we have, you know, serve our member organizations annually together, co collectively serve around 100,000 youth um, in Chicago. And 
In 2017, we were featured in the U.S. Department of Education's National Education Technology Plan. Thanks, Sana. Um, I'm curious to know a little bit more about the connection between CLX and our local efforts and the national level plan, which I don't know anything about. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so LRNG Chicago is our connection to some of the national work, but we do have sister cities kind of. Um, so there's work that's similar to us. So we were started by the MacArthur Foundation, which is a, f um, sorry, um, we were started by the MacArthur Foundation uh, in, I think, 20, 2009 or 2011. Um, and they supported projects in multiple cities. So New York, uh, Chicago, Pittsburgh, um, Toronto, and other places. Uh, we are um, focused on Chicago, at least for Chicago Learning Exchange, but hope to be participatory and almost a model for other cities on how this work can be done in, collab in a collaborative way. But that's our aspiration. Um, so one question on the document so far. How can people here contribute time, money, skills to what you're working on? Great. So if you'd like to, we have a list of member organizations. So if you want to, we can share the list with you. I mean, it's on hivechicago.org forward slash members. You can see kind of the list of organizations. So if you're passionate about arts, um, if you're passionate about uh, civic development, or if you're passionate about um, STEM, et cetera, or STEAM, um, we have kind of probably every type of organization there is. Um, so we can plug you in to those organizations. So we're always looking for mentors. We're always looking for um, folks that people, like if you're great at speaking, which Emily and Soren are obviously great at speaking, um, you know, we're, young people need exposures and they need opportunities to see what they can be if they've never obviously had an opportunity in their lives to see that. So there's opportunities there for mentorship, connection. Um, if we had a, a, an annual event called Hive Chicago Buzz, which a few folks maybe came to um, in the past, and uh, it's kind of like a two-day hack day. Um, so we'd love to get more technologists in the room with educators solving problems. Um, yeah. Hey. Um, I'm going to try to phrase this question two ways so you can answer it whichever way you want. Um, first one's more specific and then more generally. What do you believe is like the biggest roadblock to bringing the integration of apprenticeship, augmented reality, and post-standardized tested public education to scale throughout the nation? Or more generally, just how could we bring what you're already doing um, to replace public education? Did you say to replace public education? To clarify, I spend $12 on Udemy and I've learned more than I did like in college and public education was a joke compared to that. So I presume that most young people are very creative and they want to see the world not get destroyed and so they want to begin engaging problem solving and I believe that what we refer to as public education now actually works against that all the, almost all the time. So that's what I mean. Cool. Um, so we are not trying to replace teachers or public education per se, but we do hope to influence practice. Um, you know, I was a teacher, and, and not to say that, like, you know, I think teaching is perfect, um, but I think that oftentimes the, this, um, well, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Anyway, um, I'm just going to say that I think that we hope to shift practice to make sure that learning is more learner-centered, and we're seeing that this is catching up. So education policy under Obama, actually, and Bush before was kind of, and the previous president, Bush one, um, we're, we're focusing on testing and accountability, right? So, you know, Betsy Davos, if you t saw the train wreck 60 minutes episode or whatever, um, she talked about how, you know, we're, I don't know, 40th or 50th in the standardized test or whatever. But if you look at, um, standardized tests don't really show what you know, they show how well you test. Um, and so if you look at the leading education countries, so like Finland and others, they're moving towards uh, this type of learning. So I think we should try to make sure that we're learning from the folks that we want to, to be rather than just competing in this kind of rat race of like testing. Um, and we hope that young people really feel empowered to know that they can have, um, be more than just whatever their ACT or SAT score is, and that they have assets, and educators can also bring a lot to the table. Um, they can move from the front of the room to the center of the room. They can incorporate participatory practices. Um, these are the things that we hope, and I think some of the barriers are, uh, 
you know, a lack of maybe funding, a lack of will, um, or just making it not like as much of a priority. You know, it's, it's sometimes hard to measure, so people kind of then say, oh, well, then is it really real? Um, the question I have is kind of about like, what's the result and what's the end goal? So I recently read a New York Times article that uh, documented the enrollment since 1980 to 2017 of 1,700 schools. And on that list were all the Chicago-based schools. And I think it was like 23 colleges or 25 of them in Chicago land. Ultimately, African American and Latino enrollment, as they were able to document it, was never above 8% of the total body since 1980. I think the highest it was ever was like 8%. So the pathway to getting into a good job or getting into a good community or all those things are based on education and the goal is to get them into college, hopefully. But if the enrollment is so low as a percentage of the population in Chicago, there's only so many seats that are going to be at Northwestern or DePaul or Northwestern. What are some of the alternatives similar to the things that he's talking about that you all are getting young people ready for if college is not necessarily going to be the place that they're going to get into for one reason or another, like, you know, low enrollment of those populations? Yeah, so we don't have a specific uh, goal for college access. Um, that's why we don't really fit into, um, most foundations want to see like this many young people are getting to college, uh, then they don't, then a lot of those kids then end up dropping out of college for various reasons, et cetera. So we don't have that same kind of explicit target, but we have whatever target that a young person wants. So if they want to get to college, we know that educators can help them get there. Um, we mainly work in the out of school time space, so after school programs and out of school times. They don't have the same similar kind of constraints that the in school space does. Um, you know, we are trying to work to bridge that in school and out of school space. So a young person might go to, you know, school for eight hours a day and then go to, um, XY organization, Sweetwater Foundation, and learn about carpentry. Um, you know, that might get them a job with the, the union. Um, so making sure that they are, are know what the options are and available, and also understanding that a path isn't always linear. So you might start off one place, and some of those skills can be transferable. And so helping them understand and articulate the assets and kind of that, just like that badging, like, hey, I'm, a go I'm good at, um, Collaborate. I'm good at team. I'm I'm good at teamwork, um, or whatever the 21st century skills are. So helping them understand that they have assets and things that they can grow on. Um, we are also trying to link our work to so those badges. Um, you know, our big goal would be to make sure that transcripts include not just kind of your ACT and SAT score and and um, your you know, grades, but also these other accomplishments and accreditations that you receive to show kind of the holistic view. And, and universities are realizing that they need to look at not just this one thing to, um, to assess if a student should get in or not. Um, and then we also are trying to push young, are trying to also help young people that want to not go to college, but want to pursue their careers. Um, so there's a lot of great programs out there that are doing that um, and that are member that are part of our organizations. So our member organizations are kind of doing that. We are trying to do it from kind of more of the policy and, and pers perspective. Hey, so you mentioned you kind of touched on, on on aspects of this already with like the transcript changes and sort of our national focus on standardized testing, just from like a public education outlook. Um, can you talk a little about like what the the sort of policy implications or like policy work that needs to be done is, or, or and and then how you, like how Hive and Chicago Learning Exchange are involved, or how like we could get involved to advocate for that or sort of push those um, initiatives forward? Yeah. So for the policy perspective, um, so uh, CPS is actually doing some of this work. Um, so one of the movements or kind of things that people are thinking about is that most of the time in traditional education, you go based on your age, right? Or you go from one class to the next, et cetera. But it doesn't really, it's just based on time and the schedule, not really what you know and how much you know. Um, so they're piloting a, a program around competency-based competency education. So thinking about rather than just like 
how long you've been um, in the program or you know whatever class you're in, how can you um, demonstrate your competency and mastery as a way to think about that, um, as a way to level up rather than just like you're in ninth grade and 10th grade, et cetera. So when it comes to uh, brokering partnerships, developing relationships between the organizations, what are some of the areas of, of challenge that you encounter and what are maybe some types of institutions that give you the most um, uh, challenge? Oh, I love that word brokering. We use it a lot. Um, so that's exciting. Um, so, you know, technology can do so much. Technology is an accelerator, but we really believe that the human interaction is really important. And learning is incredibly relational. Rel relational. So a person, um, you know, needs that human, or especially for, for the groups that we're serving. Um, technology can sometimes maybe not be accessible. And so, for example, G and I were talking, you know, a young person might come to Sweetwater Foundation and they have this awesome smartphone and they know how to take selfies and they're a digital native, et cetera, um, but they don't know how to use Google Maps to get there. Um, so they call Gia as the broker in person um, because they know how to call and they have this thing. And so, but those relationships are really important. So I think seeing the value of the educator and the piece of the puzzle is really important and we want to make sure that the educator is also part of the solutionary rather than just kind of the most education policy reform is made by people that have actually never taught or been in education so I read something that said that mammals learn best by playing yeah we're and all about that we're all about play and it seems like people who make education policy just really don't see any value in that um, how can we learn that we, how can we learn that play is so valuable and make sure that that is like one of the number one priorities for any learning program? Um, so we're doing it, trying to do it also in multiple levels, but, um, you know, with teacher programs, um, professional development, so making sure that we get them before they're in the classroom and ch making sure the pedagogy that they learn um, incorporates play as part of it. And then also providing, we have our Hive meetups where educators come together and we provide professional development trainings, things like that, so folks can s realize that play, although, you know, might seem elementary, it doesn't have to be elementary, and that it can really help you with whatever you're trying to reach. So I was just actually watching a video earlier about um, these awesome young people in like rural India that were learning about math by dancing um, and playing, so. All right, thank you, Sana, for coming by and talking to us tonight.